Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Welcome and hello again. I am Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word, a teaching program which seeks to bring understanding to God's Word. It is my hope that as you learn a little bit more about God's Word, then you will be drawn closer to God. He is a God of love. He cares for you. And he wants you to get to know him. He knows you very well. He knows you perfectly. And he loves you just the way you are. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. We give you thanks and praise for who you are. You are our God. You are our creator. We give you thanks and praise that you have given us your word. And we pray now that as we are in your word, as we listen to your word, as we study your word, we might be drawn closer to you. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, we began to learn about why the world is so messed up. The answer to this is found in Genesis 3. Like all of the book of Genesis, we've got to understand this chapter because of its implications to the earth and to the whole human race. We heard that there was a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now serpents, in and of themselves, were not created evil. Crafty, yes. Evil, no. But there are events going on behind the scenes, if you will, in God's creation which have the potential of bringing great harm to God's good creation. God had created visible and invisible creatures, human beings and angels. God made both of them good, perfectly good. But both angels and human beings were given the freedom to walk away from God, to rebel against him. We can glean from the entirety of the Bible that one angel by the name of Lucifer, his name means light bearer, who had great rank and great beauty, decided to lead a rebellion against God. Lucifer's purpose in leading the rebellion was this. He wanted God's throne. He wanted God's throne for himself. He wanted to rise above his created station. He wanted to be God. So he led a rebellion against God. And one-third of the angels of heaven joined him in the rebellion. The remaining two-thirds of the angels fought against him. These were led by an angel whose name is Michael. Now, there was war in heaven, but Lucifer and his angels, the ones that were with them, did not prevail against Michael and his angels. Consequently, Lucifer and the angels with him lost their place in heaven and were cast down to the earth. These we know as the devil and as demons. Having been cast down and out of heaven and thrown down to the earth, Lucifer's aim now is to destroy the crown of God's creation, mankind. Now there are two reasons that Lucifer goes after mankind. The first reason is this. Mankind, humankind, was created in the image and likeness of God and given authority and rule and dominion over the whole earth and all of the creatures God had made. The second reason he would go after mankind is this. By being made in the image and likeness of God and by being given authority, rule, and dominion over the whole earth, humankind is ranked above the angels. Listen to that again. Humankind is ranked above the angels. God made us lower than himself, but higher than the angels. As far as Lucifer was concerned, this was not acceptable. 
the one who wanted God's throne for himself, most certainly did not want any other creature to have greater rank than he had. So having been cast out of heaven, Lucifer now targets the woman and the man. It is Lucifer, the angel-turned-devil, who now comes to the woman and speaks to her through the serpent. Though we are not expressly told in the Bible why the devil targeted the woman rather than the man, it could be, and I say that with great emphasis, it could be that he targeted the woman first because he knew if he could get her to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the consequence for her would be her death. And maybe, just maybe, he was thinking if he could destroy the woman before she could bear children, before she could begin to be fruitful and multiply and bear children in the image and likeness of God, that would have been a good thing for him. Okay. Now, yesterday I also mentioned that Lucifer, the devil, is not ignorant. He knew exactly what the Lord, what God, had told the man and the woman. He knew that God had told them, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, the tree known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Lucifer knew two things. He knew that the consequences for eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would be death. And he knew that if he is not successful in seducing the woman and the man, they will be fruitful and multiply. And there will be many, many, many bearers of God's image spread throughout the entire earth. This he could not bear to see happen. He had to destroy these creatures that bore God's image. These creatures who had been given rule over planet earth and rank over him. He had to destroy them. Lucifer went after the woman, not the man, with this question. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Hear that. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Yes, God most certainly did give the man and the woman this one command. By saying, did God really say, Lucifer, the serpent, was setting up a question in the woman's mind. A question which would then lead to the woman doubting the wisdom of God in giving the command in the first place. So the woman replied, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, We must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, we have no record whatsoever of God telling the man and the woman that they could not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What we are told in the scriptures is that they were told that they could not eat of its fruit. The woman's reply to the serpent actually goes beyond what God had said. She need not have added to what God said. What God said was good enough. What the woman did by adding to what God had said is what many people and many religious traditions have done throughout the course of history. That is, she added to what God had said, and in the process of adding to what God said, she raised her additional words to the same level as God's word. When she did this, when we do this, when our religious traditions do this, we actually give the devil more opportunity to trip us up. These add-ons kill us as we attempt to submit to them rather than to the living God who wants to give us life and abundant life at that. Anyway, after the serpent, after Lucifer hears the woman's answer, he responds with a bald-faced lie. He contradicts what God has told the man and the woman. He says... You will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here are the serpent's lies. They will not die. They will be like God. Here are the truths. They will, in fact, die. And they were already 
like God. They were made in God's image and according to his likeness. The serpent's deception was to get the woman to doubt the veracity, the truthfulness of what God had told them. The serpent was saying to the woman that God really didn't make you like him. If he had, you would have the exact same knowledge as he has. But you don't, do you? You don't know good and evil, which God does know. He has kept something from you. He can't be trusted. If you really want to be like God, you've got to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then your eyes really will be open and you really will be like God because you will know good and evil. The deceiver has laid his trap and the woman was about to fall for it. Now, before we pine and whine about the woman and what she is about to do, let's think about it. Let's think. Let's think about it. How often do we know exactly what God wants us to do, what God expects of us, and yet we do not do it? How often do we make excuses? How often do we hedge and dodge and weave around what we know to do or not do just so that we can justify the actions that we know are wrong. Unfortunately, we do this too often. The best response the woman could have given the devil, the tempter, the serpent, Lucifer, Satan, he is known by all these names, would have been, God said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, lest you, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. If the woman would have said this, that should have settled it for her. God said what he said, and that should have been good enough. She didn't do this. She thought that she could converse with the serpent. She thought that she could converse with the deceiver. She could not, and neither can we. Our one and only way to overcome the devil and to overcome any of his deceptive words or schemes or traps is to stick to the truth, God's truth. It is then that we are able to overcome the devil's traps and snares. And so to do this, it's imperative for us to know what God has said. And then, beyond knowing it, it's important, it's imperative, it's vital for us then to do what God has taught us in his word. To do this, to do what God says, we must spend time with God. We must spend time in his word. We must bury God's truth in our hearts. In part, this is one of the purposes of this program, to teach the truth of what God says in his word, and to teach it without apology. What God has said has not changed. What God has said in his word in the Bible is reliable. It is trustworthy, because God is trustworthy. It, meaning God's word, can keep us from succumbing to the traps the devil sets for us. God's word is life. He has given it to us so that we might live and not die. Now Genesis 3 continues. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What the man and the woman have now done by eating of the forbidden fruit, the Bible calls sin. Sin is rebellion against God, and the consequence of sin is death. Let's then consider what has died. First, the man and the woman experience the death of innocence. Prior to eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were naked 
and unashamed. But immediately upon eating of the fruit, they want to cover themselves. They want to hide their bodies from one another. And so they covered themselves with what they could find. And in their case, it was fig leaves which they sewed together. The next death that we learn about is the death of the relationship between God and mankind. Chapter 3 continues. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The man had been God's co-laborer. He had named the animals God had created. Now the man and the woman hide from their creator. The beautiful relationship that they once had with their God had been severed. There's now a rift, a separation, a chasm actually between the creator and the creatures he created in his image according to his likeness. This death of the relationship between God and mankind, which sin brings about, is actually what the Bible, what God's word, refers to as spiritual death. Spiritual death is actually more catastrophic than physical death in this. Physical death ends the physical life of a person. But spiritual death, if there is nothing done about it to restore spiritual life, and to restore the relationship, spiritual death has the potential to separate God and mankind permanently. Do you hear that? Spiritual death, if there's nothing done about it to restore the relationship and to restore spiritual life, has the potential to separate God and mankind permanently. Permanent separation from God is not bliss. It is hell. Hell is not a party. It is solitary confinement forever, and it will be torture for all who will be there. It will be torture, because God's love will be permanently removed. Thank God, and I do mean that. Thank God, God is the restorer of life and the restorer of relationships. Regardless of the kinds of deaths that take place, God can restore relationships. And soon we're going to learn what God has planned in order to put right what the man and the woman have broken. Now, there are two more things that took place when the man and the woman sinned against God. And knowing these two things really are critical to our understanding why the world is in such a mess. First, that the man and the woman's sin would have thrust the world into trouble, and that was bad enough. But when the man and the woman sinned, they also voluntarily handed over rulership and authority, the rulership and authority God had given them over the earth, they handed that over to the devil. They handed their rulership their authority over the earth and all of earth's creatures over to the devil. They gave it away. They gave away what God had given them to steward. They gave it to the devil. When they did this, they also put themselves under the devil's rule. They put themselves, believe it or not, under the rule of one who hated their existence. They put themselves under the rule of one who was trying, sneakily, to destroy them. Now this, indeed, is a horrible state of affairs. Where once the man and the woman ranked above all the creatures visible and visible, now they ranked below the devil and his demons. Talk about a mess. This was bad. A second thing also happened. With the coming of rebellion and sin into the world, a second kingdom is now established. It is a rival kingdom to God's kingdom of light. This rival kingdom, known as the kingdom of darkness throughout the Bible, 
is ruled by the devil. The devil is not love. In fact, there is no love in him whatsoever. The devil is, in fact, pure hatred. Thank God the devil's kingdom of darkness is by no means a permanent kingdom. It will someday come to a permanent end, permanently defeated by God's kingdom of light. Hear it again. Thank God the devil's kingdom of darkness is by no means a permanent kingdom. It will. It will someday come to a permanent end, permanently defeated by God's kingdom of light. Until that day comes, however, the devil and the kingdom of darkness is behind much of the trouble we experience on earth. Now, we cannot blame all of earth's troubles and all of the troubles of the world and all of the troubles that people have on the devil. He is not the cause of the entire mess the world is in. Sin-filled people cause plenty of trouble on their own as well. Now, having said all this, I must also say that we must know that God is still God. He always will be God. He always was God. He was not in any way dethroned by what the man and the woman did. His kingdom, the kingdom of light, is the kingdom with permanence. God's kingdom is the one that will last forever and ever. But in order to understand what goes on in the world, we've got to understand that there are these two kingdoms. The kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of light, and God is the ruler of that kingdom. And God, as we have said many, many times already, he is 100% pure and perfect love. That's the kingdom of light, ruled by God, perfect love. The second kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, is ruled by the devil, also known as the serpent, Satan, the dragon, Lucifer, who is 100% pure and perfect hatred. What we have set up in the scriptures and what we understand through God's word is that now we have God versus the devil, light versus darkness, 100% pure and perfect love versus 100% pure and perfect hatred, good versus evil, life versus death. These two kingdoms are polar opposites, but we have got to remember that they are not equal. Hear that again, they are not equal. Yes, it is God versus the devil, light versus darkness, 100% pure and perfect love versus 100% pure and perfect hatred, good versus evil, life versus death, but they are not equal. God's kingdom is and always will be supreme. There are other things that we need to know. Here's this. When the man and the woman sinned against God by eating of the forbidden fruit, they were transferred from God's kingdom of light to the devil's kingdom of darkness. A transfer took place. God had created the man and the woman. They were and they had been in the kingdom of light. But when they sinned, when they rebelled against God, they joined the devil and his demons in the kingdom of darkness. We also learn from the scriptures that everyone... Every single human being in the earth, anyone who is ever born, which includes all of us, all of us are born into the kingdom of darkness. All of us are born into the kingdom of darkness. Whether we like it or not, we are born into the kingdom of darkness. Indeed, when the man and the woman sinned, their actions plunged the entire earth into spiritual darkness. Now, when the man and the woman are fruitful and multiply, they pass on to their offspring the inclination or the tendency to sin. It's like sin becomes a part of their DNA. And as we know, DNA just gets passed down to the next generation and then to the next generation and then to the next generation. Wow. This is a lot to think about. And it's true. What I've told you is gleaned from the Bible as a whole and vital to understanding what God is about to say and do. 
So let's continue with Genesis 3, beginning again with verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Now, it's not like God didn't know where the man and the woman were. God is all-knowing. He knows each and every person on earth perfectly. He knows when we sit down or when we stand up. He knows everything we think, and he knows what we're going to say before we say it. He knows, and yet despite all of our faults, he loves us. He doesn't condone or excuse or even approve of the evil we do. But he does love us. Our tendency, like the man and the woman did, is to run and hide from God when we do something wrong. Our best course of action, however, would be rather to run to him. To run to the one that is perfect love. He loves us. We don't need to hide from him. He loves us. So God calls to the man, where are you? And the man answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. So I hid. Did you hear what has also entered into the world? Fear. Fear. Fear didn't exist. It did not exist before the man and the woman sinned. So God replied to the man, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? God had asked the man a simple and direct question. All the man needed to do was answer, Yes, I've eaten from the tree you commanded me not to eat from. But this is not what happens. What happens is we see an immediate multiplication of sin. Listen to now what the man says. The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Did you hear it? The man not only faults the woman, but he faults God for his present predicament because it was, after all, God who put the woman into the garden with the man. And then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is where we're going to conclude today. And so, let me just bless all of you who are out there, everybody who is listening. I pray, I certainly pray that you are learning how wonderful God's Word is and how it does answer so many of our questions that we have in life. But the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bless you all. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer, and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.